Bienvenue and welcome. Try to finish your cotton candy and guzzle down your soda because we're getting ready to discuss the sophomore effort of Mr. Wesley Wales Anderson, a little gem by the name of Rushmore. This time watching it, I was struck by what a leap forward it is creatively. Bottle rockets got hard, I'll give it that, but the technical side of the filmmaking, cinematography, acting, and writing is much improved, as well as the unquantifiable side, emotional honesty and comedic timing. Anderson seems to have taken practical lessons from his first feature and challenged himself creatively to boot. The visuals are strong, the humor comes flying at you fast, and the characters forming the three sides of Rushmore's bizarre love triangle are beautifully sketched. Speaking of character sketching, the film was written by Owen Wilson and Wes Anderson, reuniting after their not-so-well-received Bottle Rocket script to write something that feels more personal. The film stars Jason Schwartzman as Max Fisher, an eccentric student at Rushmore Academy, Bill Murray as Herman Bloom, a wealthy, depressed steel magnate, Olivia Williams as Rosemary Cross, a teacher at Rushmore mourning the loss of her husband, Seymour Cassell as Burt Fisher, a kind barber and Max's dad, and Brian Cox as Dr. Guggenheim, the headmaster of Rushmore who treats Max as a constant thorn in his side. Rushmore marks the film debut of Schwartzman, who would have been around 17 when they made the film. Comparing his performance with Luke and Owen Wilson's film debuts in Bottle Rocket, it's not even close. The Wilson brothers got more comfortable in front of the camera as their careers went on, but Schwartzman debuts as a fully formed actor. Max Fisher is a fantastically layered character. Most of the time, Max is putting on a performance for the people he's talking to, play acting as an adult, but there are scenes that require him to be emotionally raw. Schwartzman nails both. For instance, his scenes with the headmaster, Dr. Guggenheim, my favorite scenes in the movie, have a very Dennis the Menace, Mr. Wilson dynamic. When Dr. Guggenheim comes out of, oh, wait a second, that's actually Dennis the Menace as Max's sidekick. Interesting. Well, moving on. When Dr. Guggenheim comes out of the chapel, he doesn't have to turn around to see who's accosting him. He knows it's Max. It's always Max. Dr. Guggenheim even gets the line in the movie that nails down the Max Fisher character who, until then, seems like the stereotypical academic overachiever. What's his name again? Max Fisher. Sharp little guy. He's one of the worst students we've got. That's right, Max is a terrible, awful, never seen an A in his life student at Rushmore, and after an ace montage by Anderson, we realize he's too caught up in extracurriculars to waste his time studying. This is the key decision that makes the movie work. Max is so caught up in the idea of being the perfect Rushmore student that he ends up being the worst Rushmore student. It's the thing that separates him from classic film and TV overachievers like Tracy Flick and Rory Gilmore. Max is talented, sure, but he's not interested in using that talent for his studies. He's more interested in spending his time... Oh, wait, wait a second, is that Rory Gilmore? Interesting. Well, moving on. I wouldn't necessarily call Max a believable character. He's far too good at pretending to be an adult. He's a stylized character in a stylized world. But he has recognizable qualities, like his immaturity, that make him compelling. He has no idea what he wants out of the Miss Cross relationship. He only acts like he does, and the scene where she calls him out is the best. Max, mm -hmm. can I ask you something? Sure. Has it ever crossed your mind that you're far too young for me? It crossed my mind that you might consider that a possibility, yeah? Quite apart from the fact that if you're a student... Of... I'm not trying to pressure you into anything, Miss Cross. I'm surprised you brought it up so bluntly. I just want to make sure. It's easy to feel sympathy for Max, knowing what it's like to ache for belonging in an adult world, and Olivia Williams is flawless at conveying hidden pain as she tries to distance herself from Max. It's a complex scene, and even though it's taking place in Anderson's artificial realm, the emotions feel honest. That's the key distinction between this movie and Bottle Rocket. In Rushmore, Anderson succeeds at using cinematic artifice to capture genuine emotions. Everything from the unbelievable special effects in Max's plays to the British Invasion soundtrack adds to the overall effect of the film. In Matt Zoller cites his book, The Wes Anderson Collection, he talks to the director about his use of artifice in the film. Here's what Wes Anderson had to say. 
In Rushmore, we had these curtains with the months projected on them. And my agent, who I love, was like, Yeah, you don't need that. That's just a show-off thing. It doesn't help. It takes you out of the story and the reality of the movie. And I can tell there's a curtain on a movie set there, because it looks like a real thing. And I said, it's supposed to look like a real thing. I know, but I can tell there's a curtain where you're shooting it. I know. Yeah, but there's not supposed to be. It's supposed to be people. Real people. And I said, well, I know that, yes, but I do want the curtain there. It's just, what are you excited about when you see the movie? For me, often what might take somebody else out of it is what I think is just the most beautiful thing, and I'd rather have that. In fact, Anderson got to have more creative control for this film. For instance, he got to shoot the film in anamorphic widescreen, a 239 aspect ratio, which was something he wanted to do for Bottle Rocket, a film filled with Texas landscapes, but the idea was vetoed. This time it's not exactly an obvious choice since the Rushmore script doesn't cry out for the widescreen treatment. It takes place mostly in schools, revolves around three characters, and, perhaps most damningly, it's a comedy. A genre usually better fit for the more square 185 aspect ratio. However, Anderson uses the format to give the audience austere close-ups, where the actor's face only fills about a third of the frame. He can also fit more characters into the frame at once, which lessens the use of shot reverse shot, an editing technique which can kill comedic timing. Not to say that Anderson doesn't trust his editor, David Moritz. The editing in this movie is way faster paced, allowing time for more jokes and less time for awkward lingering. The comedic montages are crammed with visual humor and reveal a lot about the characters. The montage of all the school clubs at the beginning of the film informs the audience exactly what kind of dilettante Max really is. It's clear that, out of all his extracurriculars, Max is genuinely passionate about his plays. He writes all of them on the typewriter his late mother gave him, and, in the movie's grand finale, uses his play to heal friendships and bring all the characters together. Even Rory Gilmore, I guess. The play brings Vietnam vet Herman Bloom to tears, giving the character a desperately needed catharsis. Bill Murray's incredible at portraying all facets of Herman, from his deeply depressed ennui to his sudden explosions of anger. Murray worked for scale on the movie, doing it for around $9,000, and he's probably the biggest reason why a movie about oddballs at an elite private school was so successful. Clearly Anderson's inherently drawn to stories about oddballs, Dignan, Max Fisher, etc., but a distinct feeling I had while watching Rushmore was melancholy. Both films have this kind of silent aching in them. Dignan wants to belong to a cabal of thieves and Max yearns for Miss Cross. It's a little deflating to see characters desire something that the audience knows is bad for them. Maybe it's because the story is partially inspired by reality. Owen Wilson was kicked out of his high school for cheating, mirroring Max's expulsion. Is there joy to be found in Wes Anderson? I think so, but not undiluted joy. Max's youthful love is unrequited, Dignan's victory at being an outlaw is Pyrrhic, joy mixed with sadness, melancholy mixed with a scene where Bill Murray is stung repeatedly by bees. I'll take it. I think I'm starting to understand Anderson's style. Next up on our journey, pull on your red tracksuit and prepare for family dysfunction because we'll be discussing Wes Anderson's The Royal Tenenbaums. And if you'd like more videos about directors both living and deceased, hit that subscribe button to stay up to date on this channel. And as always, the Ceres wheel spins on.